Well, today Israel did pass the judicial reforms, and I kind of wanted to explain what some of the information is about what just happened there with this bill passing. And it does have to do with this reasonableness clause. And um, what is Israel's reasonableness legislation and why is it so contentious? This is recorded July 23rd, 2023. The Israeli Knesset Parliament has passed legislation that would limit the High Court of Israel's ability to review the reasonableness of government decisions. This highly contentious legislation part of a large debate in Israel over reforms to the country's judiciary. Over the last six months, hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens in a country of just over nine million have taken to the streets of Tel Aviv and other major cities each weekend to protest the reforms and other aspects of the current government. This protest movement has ramped up demonstrations against the legislation with some 200,000 demonstrating across the country ahead of the proposal's expected second reading at the Knesset. Opposition to the legislation has also spread across the key sectors of Israeli society with business leaders, labor leaders, physicians, and even members of the Israel Defense Forces Reserves. Over 10,000 IDF reservists from dozens of units have said that they would end their volunteer duty if the government passes the legislation leading to fears that it could hamper the IDF's preparedness and cohesion. Below is the breakdown of the new law, why it is so contentious, and AJC's position. What exactly is in the new law, and what is its status in the Knesset? The law would specifically prohibit Israeli courts from using what's called the reasonableness doctrine to review decisions made by the Israeli cabinet, government ministers, and other unspecified elected officials as determined by law. The legislation was drawn up by M.K. Simka Rothman, Religious Zionism, and was approved by the Knesset Constitution Law and Justice Committee on July 4th. The legislation was advanced with the nine committee sessions preparing the core text of the substantive amendment to Israel's quasi-constitutional basic laws. Israel does not have a written constitution and its basic laws serve as the foundation for the country's legal system and government structure. The Knesset on July 11th passed the first reading of the law in a 64 to 56 vote. On July 24th, the legislation passed the second and third readings with a majority of 64 votes in favor, thereby enacting the legislation into law. The opposition boycotted the final vote. What to know about Israel's judicial reforms? And what is the history of the reasonableness doctrine under the Israeli law? reasonableness standard in Israeli law finds its roots in various legal traditions and influences Israel's legal system, draws inspiration from Jewish law, or halakha, British common law, and legal principles adopted by other Western legal systems. So, isn't that interesting? The reasonable standard includes British common law. So there's another proof that King Charles III would be welcome there as king. Jewish law has a long history of emphasizing reasonableness and fairness in legal decision making. The principle of Derek Eretz, literally the way of the land, in Jewish law encompasses ethical conduct and reasonable behavior. It guides individuals to act in a manner that is just, equitable, and considerate of others. Influences from British common law, which had a significant impact on the development of Israeli law, 
also shaped the reasonableness standard. The British legal system, with its emphasis on reasonableness, fairness, and the reasonable person standard, has been influential in many legal jurisdictions worldwide. Wow, so they would not even probably blink an eye to become members of the Commonwealth and to have the king as the king over their country. The Israeli legal system further incorporated these concepts through the adoption of British legal principles during the Mandate period. There you go, 1920 to 1948. During this time, the British Mandate authorities introduced English law into the legal framework of the land that would later become the State of Israel. The British legal system's concepts, including the reasonableness standards or standard, were thus integrated into Israeli jurisprudence. So, the British legal system's concepts are all over the Israeli law. Over time, Israeli courts have continued to develop and refine the reasonableness standard based on Israeli case law, legal scholarship, and comparative legal analysis. The standard has been applied across various areas of Israeli law such as tort law, administrative law, and contract law to assess the reasonableness of actions, decisions, and behaviors. So what do the proponents of the reasonableness legislation say? Supporters of the legislation argue that the current standard for judicial intervention is too subjective and because it allows the High Court to subvert government authority, it contradicts the rule of law. Further proponents say that such a broad judicial review of administrative action is also not seen in other democratic countries. Elected officials they say are chosen by the voters to make decisions on matters great and small and it is not for ju a judge to decide questions of values. This has become particularly sensitive in regard to the appointment of government ministers such as the decision earlier this year by the High Court to block Shaz Chairman Aryeh Derry as Interior and Health Minister using the reasonableness doctrine. Proponents argue that it is the Prime Minister's job to select members of their cabinet and the judiciary is undemocratically interfering in the executive's ability to govern. Reasonableness, they say, has become one of the many expanded powers used by the activist court to undermine a democratically elected government. And why are they doing that? Because the whole goal is to reestablish the ancient monarchy. And that's what I'm telling you the Holy Spirit revealed from the book of Revelation. And all of you have seen those videos, but anyway, mostly, but <clears throat> what to know about Israel's judicial reforms, effort, and protests what do opponents of the reasonableness legislation say? Critics of the legislation, including Israel's Attorney General, say that reasonableness is an essential standard in the Israeli legal system and one of the few measures that the judiciary has to check on the excess of Israel's heavily centralized executive branch of government. Canceling that standard, they say, would remove the only tool for reviewing arbitrary and highly unreasonable decisions by the government. This is made more important in countries without a written constitution like Israel. So basically, you know, I think they see it as becoming more like a dictatorship than a democracy. And you can have an absolute monarchy where the king has all the say and the people do not have their voices heard. 
This would harm law enforcement and other agencies, including unreasonable appointments to key positions based on political or personal association. Ah, so they could they could implement and appoint the king to admit them into the commonwealth to bring about the peace and security between the seven-year agreement of the trade and tech, climate change, and gender change uh, agreement that Israel signed with the UK. Uh, they could bring it in without opposition, apparently. For example, the decision to appoint Arye Derry as Health and Interior Minister by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was made despite his past criminal convictions. Derry, as part of his 2022 plea bargain, promised he would not return to public life. The High Court ruled that due to Derry's criminal history, he has been convicted twice of crimes 20 22 and 2000 and served a stint in prison in 2002 was unreasonable in the extreme and allowed the application of the reasonableness doctrine to disqualify him from serving as a minister as such appointments of the bill fear that since the legislation is limited to elected officials it could lead to a growth in corruption so basically what it's saying is that, you know, these leaders could appoint who they wanted without the opposition interfering in their appointments. Um, if something was unreasonable and unfair, they would be able to pass it anyway. Okay, so... AJC expressed concern over the Knesset's vote to advance one element of the governing coalition's judicial reform package, deepening existing divisions instead of resuming the compromise negotiations conducted by President Herzog. AJC continues to support President Herzog's efforts to facilitate a compromise between the supporters and opponents of judicial reform. President Herzog today stated that an agreement is attainable. We urge the parties to heed his calls. From the onset of the judicial reform process, AJC has expressed our firm belief that any changes to Israel's judicial system should result from a deliberative, inclusive process that upholds the democratic values of maintaining checks and balances respecting minority rights and civil liberties, and preserving essential judicial independence. Following the law's passage, AJC issued a new statement. Um, and I'll put the link to this article in the description box. What are Israeli leaders saying? Prime Minister Netanyahu said that curbing the ability of the High Court to use the reasonableness standard in reviewing government decisions would strengthen democracy. Even after the fix, the rights of the courts and Israeli citizens will not be harmed in any way, Netanyahu said in a video statement. The court will continue to inspect the legality of government decisions and appointments. Yair Lapid, former Prime Minister and current head of the opposition, has called on the government coalition to halt the legislation and renew negotiations on consensus changes to the Israeli judiciary. Similarly, a fellow member of the opposition, Benny Gantz of the National Unity Party, also called for the resumption of talks. Three key takeaways from the AJC CEO Ted Deutsch conversation with Israel's leader of the opposition party, Yair Lapid. Um, Israeli President Isaac Herzog, who had been hosting talks over the judicial reforms between the government and opposition parties, reissued a similar call for the resumption of talks. Talks were halted in June over disagreements over the selection of members of the Judicial Nomination Committee. Other key 
aspects of the government's judicial reform proposal. There are currently no plans to return to discussions right now. In the middle of a deep and worrying crisis, the responsible thing to do as a leader is to sit and talk, but Israeli unity before everything else, the president said. What is the United States saying? U.S. President Joe Biden has urged Prime Minister Netanyahu to slow the process and achieve broad consensus before passing any meaningful constitutional changes. According to a White House readout from his call with Netanyahu on July 17th, Biden reiterated the need for the broadest possible consensus and that shared democratic values have always been and must remain a hallmark of the U.S.-Israel relationship. So what they do is slowly, slowly implement these new laws and slowly, slowly change it. And then before you know it, they implement more and more of what they want. And this leads to the reestablishment of Israel's ancient monarchy. And I truly believe this is the truth and what's going to happen because the Holy Spirit showed it to me in the book of Revelation. And also the fact that the Sanhedrin wants to become the world supreme court. So obviously if they become Israel a member of the British Commonwealth because they have part of British law on their own books it wouldn't be too hard to uh, apply to be a member of the Commonwealth and have the king as their king as their anointed one seeing him as a messianic figure and we all know where that's leading during the time of Jacob's trouble in the seven years. So all of this is really important. What's happening now, a lot of people can't see that it's more than just what's right in your face. They can't see the big picture. But um, I'm sharing what I know and what the Holy Spirit shown me from the Bible. So I truly believe that since they have part of the British legal system as their system, you know, there's really no reason why they wouldn't accept King Charles III as the anointed one. And he would be the broker of the peace and security that is in that seven-year agreement that they just made with the UK, with Israel. And if the Palestinians join, and he would be the middleman the one to broker the peace between the two and the security between the two and the allowance of the uh, implementation of what's going on on the Temple Mount and who controls that and can Israel build a temple there and have a place there to set up the temple again. Um, all of this just really is something. And if you also think about, you know, Daniel the prophet, Daniel was the prince of Judah with other princes of Judah that were taken to Babylon. And so in the last days, it's showing that Israel's putting up another king on that throne of Judah. And then it's going to take that seven years of, it's like what I told you yesterday, that Nebuchadnezzar was a king and he was worshiping all these false gods in Babylon. And until he acknowledged, there was a point in time when God turned him into like a beast. A beast is a king. And he had seven years that he had to go through until he acknowledged God as his king. Um, in Israel's case, this seven year time of Jacob's trouble with this king that's a beast to reestablish sitting on the throne of Judah, they will have that seven year time until they acknowledge that God is their Yeshua. It says that in their own Jewish Bible. God has become my salvation, my Yeshua. So until they acknowledge that, you know, the beast king will have this seven year time until they acknowledge their king. So 
all of this is leading to this you know one world leader that's a king and you know bringing all of the religions there onto the Temple Mount for all the nations of the world to supposedly they see themselves as light unto the nations but Jesus is the one, the true Messiah, the King of Kings, is the one who is the light unto the nations. And he brought the living Torah to the entire world. And he's coming back. And before that happens, they are in disbelief up there. Especially the ultra-Orthodox. Um, they want to get rid of Jesus' name, the name of salvation. They want to get rid of the gospel message of the good news that they can have eternal life through God's Holy Spirit through the covenant that Jesus made in his blood at the last Passover Seder in the cup of redemption. So Israel has to acknowledge this and their redemption will happen, you know, but you cannot just ignore God's greatest testimony ever and expect a redemption to go in your favor you know what I mean so with all of this and with all of the British legal system being part of the Jewish system that started with the British mandate how easy for them to return to okay this is the king he can sort this out We've got problems with Benjamin Netanyahu's health. Um, and here's one who's from the outside that has supposedly a genealogical line going back to David and Solomon. Somebody who's supposedly a rightful heir to the throne. And this is how they would see it. Now, it's really incredible things that are happening. The other thing, too, is that in ancient times when you had a king sitting upon the throne, they believed in the divine right of kings, which really isn't in effect right now. But they believed that God put that king on the throne. And so in a lot of ways, he could sit on the throne and the people would actually see him as God sitting upon the throne. So you can see how he could sit in the third temple proclaiming himself to be God because he's the legal uh, rightful heir sitting upon that throne and especially if they think his genealogy goes back to David and Solomon then that would just seal the deal and not to mention the fact that supposedly the stone of Schoon is Jacob's pillow stone or Jacob's pillar that he anointed with the oil of you know the royalty and anytime a king was coronated in Israel in Judah he would stand by the pillar that was anointed and that's where he would be coronated and he probably would sit on that stone back in those days so they're just continuing on the tradition by having the Stone of Schoon. Now, I won't get into arguments about whether it really is from Scotland or really is from Israel in Bethel, but, you know, nevertheless, if this is the mindset and a lot of the Jewish people were involved in King Charles III's coronation and, you know, they have a huge part of the British legal system in their law books, why wouldn't they just sign up to become part of the Commonwealth? That's what I see happening. So with that, I'll just say I'll see you in the next video. And if you want to read about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and incredible revelations in a massive book that I wrote, directed by the Holy Spirit, um, it's the Almond Tree Aaron's Rod, the Messiah King of Israel, at olivepresspublisher.com This being the end near the time of Jacob's trouble, the last seven years, for King Charles to become king just right before that starts is something that only God could make this happen, you know, and it's going to happen. 
So um, I'm going to have to go for now. I have to run a couple of errands before it gets to be almost 100 degrees outside here. Um, I know it's not Arizona temperatures but or New Mexico temperatures, but boy is it hot and too hot for me. Um, so I'll be back. I've got a few more interesting uh, stories to tell you that are going to be really fascinating. So hang on and I'll talk to you just in a little bit.